Organizing stories can be hard, but it doesn't have to be. Campfire Pro is a writing software with tons of tools to keep you organized. Its character pages will help you keep track of all your characters with details and backstories, timelines to help you hammer out plot points and even track character arcs, and use the map page to create all the locations you need. Definitely check out their brand new world building pack. It's an expansion to Campfire Pro that's going to help you construct new species, items, magic systems, and develop your cultures with the religions, philosophies, and languages. Do away with all those word docs and spreadsheets and keep everything easy and accessible with Campfire Pro. There's a link in the description below. Be sure to go check it out. Hey everybody, welcome to the Dungeon Cast. I'm Brian. And I'm Will. This is the podcast where we talk about everything Dungeons and Dragons, from Mighty Mystics to Midnight Marauders, and today we're talking about Medusa. Medusa's. <laughs> the Dungeon Cast. We're not talking about the singular Medusa. Medusa. There are many Medusae. Medusae. <laughs> Medusas? Me, or Medusas. I, I started off Medusae. with my notes saying Medusas, uh, and then I was reading through, I think I think it was just, just Wikipedia on the Medusa, and apparently the plural for Medusa is Medusae. So Medusae. I started using Medu- Medusae about halfway through these notes. To a, like a, fo- a townsfolk, it would be the Medusa, though, because there's probably not a bunch of them up there. Um, No, not necessarily true. There might be a tribe of them. A tribe of Medusa? <laughs> we'll then it would be that. the Medusas. Yeah, indeed. So let's get into it. Okay. So in Dungeons and Dragons, Medusas are lawful evil humanoid monstrosities that are said to be simultaneously beautiful and hideous in appearance. Mm. Uh, they have very mysterious and conflicting origins across the various editions, which is pretty common with some of these more like classic D&D monsters. Um, and they are most infamous for two quintessential qualities. Number one, having serpents for hair. Number yeah. two, having a gaze that can petrify their targets. Those, okay. Those yeah. are the major two. One yeah. of them is a magic power and the other one is an aesthetic staple. Also kind of a magic power though, because like, how are those snakes alive? They just are. Oh, yeah. Okay. This is, isn't, her, <laughs> isn't the snake like a bot, the body? Oh, sorry. Isn't the body a snake? Sort of like the lower half the slither about. Um, no, 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 no. The Medusa are uh, just like humanoids. Oh, sick. Yeah. Okay, so I was thinking of, like, I've seen it depicted with the snake body. Oh, yeah, like a classic Gorgon from, like, uh, the original Clash of the Titans. Yes, yes. that's exactly what yes. I'm thinking of. Which is a good, that's a good look. It's more like a UNT. Take that but... chick to Mirror Town. <laughs> right. Stab, so, stab. We'll get into the physical appearance okay. in a bit. But, uh, yes, uh, Medusae are based off of, directly off of the Greek mythological being Medusa, who is one of the three Gorgons in Greek mythology, which is not to be confused with D&D Gorgons, which are an entirely different thing based off... <laughs> the Ethiopian mythological creature called the Katobopaz, which is not to be confused with the D&D Katobopaz, which is also <laughs> based off of its Ethiopian counterpart, but is much different from the D&D Gorgon. So now let's get back to Medusa's. I'm like, which way do I go? Uh, <laughs> Those will get their own episodes one day. Shout out to, to Gorgon? <laughs> no, that's not no. right. No. Okay. So in Greek, in Greek mythology, Medusa was a monster known as a Gorgon, uh, generally described as a winged humanoid female with living venomous snakes in place of hair. So they're po- they're poisonous. They're, uh, yes, the snakes mecha- are poisonous. They're mechanically horrifying up there. Uh, yes. Okay. Both in the game, but also this is Greek mythology. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. I, I did this a few episodes ago where I just was like, <laughs> I'm in D&D mode. Okay. Yeah, we're no, talking totally about Greece understand. right now. We're talking about, Greece. about ancient Greece. Uh, and yeah, Medusa was actually described as a winged humanoid female, not a, not a more serpentine one. She just had living venomous snakes in place of hair. Uh, those who gaze upon the face of Medusa would turn to stone. In the earliest Greek writings, Medusa appears in she is considered to be one of three sisters born of Phorcus, the primordial, primordial sea, uh, a primordial sea god, and Seto, a sea goddess most noted for bearing multiple famous Greek monsters as children, including Medusa and her sisters. Okay. So later on, around the 5th century BCE, the legend of Medusa had changed her origin story to that of a mortal human maiden of ravishing beauty, and whose beauty was itself a curse, as she was the constant aspiration of jealous suitors, including the Olympian god Poseidon, who ended up raping uh, Medusa as she sought out refuge inside a temple of Athena. Uh, and now Athena, who is the supposed goddess of wisdom, uh, instead of her being like, yo, Poseidon, like, what the fuck, bro? Get the fuck out of my temple and okay. leave this poor woman alone. Instead, she victim blames poor Medusa and she punishes Medusa by transforming Medusa's beautiful hair into serpents and making her face so terrible to behold that the mere sight of it would turn on Lucas to stone. Um, so... I guess that's the thing about Medusa I didn't realize was I always thought like she had like petrifying eye powers. Okay. No, she's just so fucking ugly. I guess you turn to stone when you see her. 
Oh, what? That's according <laughs> like, to Greek yeah. mythology. Yeah. Okay, that was a rough story. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it's it's a rough story. We I mean, should you... call this part of the show the Greco cast. <laughs> the Greco cast. We, we talk should. about Greek stuff so much. It comes up a lot. So Medusa is most famous for her part of the story of Perseus, the greatest of the Greek heroes and the slayer of monsters. Perseus set out to murder Medusa because of a really fucking stupid promise that he made to a king, um, and with the help and guidance, <laughs> yeah, and with the help and guidance of, uh, of Athena, he attained both the tools and knowledge to kill Medusa. And, Medusa, and he also garnered Medusa's secret location from Athena. So Athena must have really, really hated Medusa for some reason. Like, okay. I'm not sure what Medusa did to her, but she really fucking hates her. So it's honestly kind of messed up because all the gods really get on and on the fuck Medusa train. Cause, <laughs> fuck cause, snakes. Because Zeus gives Perseus an adamantine sword. Hades gives him a helm of darkness. Hermes gives him winged sandals. And Athena give, gives him a mirror shield. Go wreck the shop <laughs> of the damn Medusa. Indeed. We're sick of that. Indeed. We're sick of that fool. It's so true. <laughs> wow. So Medusa's part in this tale ends when uh, Perseus cuts off her head and then offers it to Athena, who then mounts Medusa's head on her shield like a fucking psychopath. Well, because now she has the, the petrifying the power. Petrifying yeah, power. it's true. She's like, this is going to be sick. Yeah, this is going to be dope. <laughs> <laughs> so all I'm really saying here is that Medusa really is the victim of this story. And also uh, Perseus is kind of this this basic like prototype of a D&D character. Okay. Or almost like a, a Link character, a guy who like collects all the items, does all the trials, and then he goes and kills the monster. That's cool. Yeah. In Breath of the Wild, you can skip all that shit. It's true. You can. So now for D&D Medusas, or Medusae, as apparently Medusas. is proper. Uh, the physical appearance of Medusae is not exactly cohesive across the editions. Some source books depict them as ugly and monstrous beings with bodies that are covered in scales rather than hair. And they have writhing mass, a writhing mass of serpents growing up from their scalp. Okay. They're facial- Anywhere else? Uh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> From the pits? I wish. Other, other people That's carries. a homebrew. That's, that's, a, that's, homebrew. A, that's a homebrew. That's a dark, dark <laughs> homebrew. Oh, no. That's a weird, oddly detailed, specific homebrew. <laughs> um, their facial features are also incredibly serpentine in appearance. Okay. Um, similar to that of a uh, UNT Pureblood. Or Voldemort. Or Voldemort, yeah. Okay. Um, they have uh, reptilian eyes with vertical slits, flat, vague impressions of a nose with two narrow nostrils, forked tongues, and razor-sharp te- uh, fangs for teeth. Other depictions of Medusa portray them as deceptively beautiful upon first glance. This version's scales are much more subdued, only covering parts of their body uh, that are easily hidden beneath clothing. Okay. Um, they have uh, shapely and seductive feminine forms, and their faces are statuesque and striking to look upon. Uh, such a Medusa can pass for human, so long as it takes the effort to hide its reptilian features. <laughs> Just oh. put that shit up in a bun, girl. <laughs> right. Head wrap. Let's yeah. go. Or like a really ornate like uh, like crown thing. Tell all the snakeheads <clears throat> to tuck. Yeah. <laughs> it's too funny. Um, so, oh yeah, uh, the typical Medusa has pale skin and stands about five to six feet tall. So, you know, average human height. All right, so easy to disguise up. Yeah, well, one version. The other version's super hard to disguise up. <laughs> so, it just depends on your edition. The other version's a fucking full-on freak. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. So the origins of the D&D Medusa are also varied and dependent on which edition you're referring to. Earlier editions gloss over the origin story entirely and explain the species per generation as done by way of mating. So it's like they're just creatures that live in the world. We don't know where they come from, but they breed and that's how they, they procreate. Just like estranged cousins of the Yuan T. Yeah, they, it gets chalked up to stuff like that. It really okay. doesn't get explained. And that's really common for um, a lot of the like monsters from real world mythology in the early editions they just like they don't feel the need to explain it because like theoretically your players are already familiar with what a gorgon is yeah uh, just because of like town lore or whatever exactly monsters existing in the world yeah well i just mean like the players in real life are familiar with the monster so they don't feel the need to explain it yeah sure this whole like really getting into like the lore of DD hasn't only really started around like third fourth edition where things started getting juicy and quite frankly i think fifth edition does it better than any other edition they really get into that lore. They say the Gorgon is mine now and it's going to have <laughs> specific stuff related to this edition. Right, exactly. Okay. So, Medusae mate with UNT, male humanoids or male Medusae, which do exist. Male ones do exist and we will cover them later in the episode. Okay. Um, Because they, they're pretty interesting actually. Are those like Mandusas? <laughs> <laughs> no, but they should be. They're called uh, Midar. Mid- uh, okay, Midar. they do have a different name. Yeah, they do have a different name. Interesting. But Mandusa is way better. <laughs> uh, where was I? Oh yeah, so 4th edition. So, 4th edition does at least 
acknowledge the idea that an origin story for Medusa should exist, but rather than defining one, it simply talks about a few in lore theories what of the where fuck? Medusa come from. <laughs> what the fuck, though? <laughs> I know, right? So essentially, we should really do this, but eh, well, we're not gonna. I ain't gonna uh, non commit here. <laughs> essentially, the Fourier lore is that no one really knows. Uh, <laughs> okay, so that is also non commit. <laughs> well, they're like I said, they give theories. So the fake creatures believe that Medusas are cursed descendants of elves, betrayers who willingly bow to Zaheer, the god of serpents and assassins, and help to, uh, slaughter an entire Eladrin city. Human dwarf sages believe that Medusas are the progeny of UNT and Basilisk, Basilisk blood. Now, Basilisks are reptilian creatures that turn snakes. to stone, okay. turn into stone. So, and they're not snake like at all. The basilisk? Like, yeah, the basilisk isn't snake like at all in DD. God damn it. Harry As a matter of fact, I don't think the basilisk, I, I could be wrong here actually, but I'm pretty sure the basilisk isn't actually certain like in real lore either. I think that was a Harry Potter thing, but I could be wrong. I could be totally wrong. I'm going to look it up during the short rest. Okay, please do. Okay. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, the dwarves and humans think they're just, like, UNT abominations. Um, That's kind of interesting that you can't nail it down. Like, give me a history check. It's like, nobody knows. Yeah. It's a big cop-out, but it's lore-based. But but also, it's realistic, too, if you think about it in a lot of ways. Like, there are a lot of things that we know about history. We don't actually know. We just are pretty sure or maybe not that sure at all. We just are, you know, yeah. Some uh, some ancient alien stuff? No, no, <laughs> not like that. But, you know, a lot of history is just conjecture. But um, where was I? So other scholars theorize that Zaheer, again, the god of assassins and serpents, remade portions of the dragonborn and the human race during the chaos of Fall of the Dawn War. But no matter how the Medusas were created, all races believe them to be unnatural creatures. Okay. So you said a lot of things right there that I only know about because of this podcast. Right. <laughs> I do. I do what I can to so, spread the knowledge. Sorry, new listeners on that sentence. <laughs> right. So 5e presents uh, a powerful curse as the origin of all Medusae. So men and women who desire eternal youth, beauty, and adoration might pray to malicious gods or beg dragons of ancient magic or seek out powerful archmages to fulfill their wishes. Okay. To be beautiful forever. Um, uh, <laughs> Get rid of the snakes, please. Right. So others make sacrifices to demon lords or archdevils, offering all in exchange for this gift, oblivious to the curse that naturally follows it. So those who strike such bargains gain physical beauty, restored youth, and immortality, and also this unnatural adoration of all who behold them, granting them both influence and power uh, that they desire. Mm. Uh, however, after years of living like a demigod among mortals, the price for their vanity and hubris is exacted, and they are forever transformed into Medusas. Dang. A Medusa's hair turns into a nest of venomous serpents, and all who gaze upon the Medusa are petrified, becoming stone monuments to its corruption. Um... Now, I like this because this is similar in the best ways to the ancient Greek mythology of like Medusa was a maiden so beautiful, blah, 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 blah. Except for mm -hmm. we flipped the script. Instead of Medusa wanting to be beautiful or forever, Medusa was looking for a fucking cure to her goddamn problem and the gods fucked her. Yeah. But like this, I, I like this. This is a, a simple, elegant piece of lore that makes sense and can always explain like new Medusas popping up. Cool. And with that being said, let's take a short rest. Let's do it. All right. Hey everybody, welcome to the part of the episode we're not talking about that last thing, we're talking about the love that we have for the people that love this show, <laughs> or even just like it, or just put it on the background. Let's Indeed. go. Love you. Love you. Yeah, also love you. Will loves you. Let's do the Patreon thing, where we talk about our patrons in a loving way, and tell <laughs> yes. them that we love them. Indeed. And to thank them for coming on board and remind them about their bonus content. Indeed. Ah, uh, mm -hmm. here we go. Ella Grant. Thank you, Ella. Zach. Thank you, Zach. Tyndall. Thank you, Tyndall. Zach Tyndall. <laughs> Zach, sorry, I got. I, <laughs> I wrote it. God damn I wrote it kind of funny, and I because um, I can't erase on this pad. Thank you, Zach. Uh, Jared Sawecki. Thank you, Jared. Justin Geiler. Thank you, Justin. Andrew Becker. Thank you, Andrew. Bubble Laser. Thank you, Bubble Laser. Sam Holt. Thank you, Sam. The Irish Viking. Thank you, Irish Viking. That darn monkey love. Thank you, that darn monkey love. Uh, okay, so what do we want to talk about now? <laughs> um, the only thing I think we got going on right now is our contest giving away the book 
Explorer's Guide to Wild Mod? Uh, wild, wild Now. How are we still now. getting this? Like, how are we still doing this? <laughs> it's like I got this blank spot in my brain for anything Critical Role. It's like oh it doesn't God. exist to me. Disrespect. But I'm sure plenty of our <laughs> listeners are excited about the uh, source book. Because, they are. Yeah, because it's a very popular series. It and is. And we're giving away a copy of the book, people, <laughs> on March 17th, which is when it comes out. And if you want this book, all you have to do is share our show, not their show, our show, on social media. Um, Twitter's the easiest one. Just go ahead and share a link to the show with the hashtag Dungeon Guest. I'll go ahead and catch that, put you guys on the list. If you share it on another social media platform that isn't Instagram, just send us a screenshot to the DungeonCast at gmail.com and that will also get you added to the list. And if you do both, if you're the same person and you do one of each, that's two entries. Um, and then Brian has some instructions for you if you're on Instagram. Make a post about the Dungeon Cast and tag us. Make sure you're following the account. You, oh, did, you did it. it. Yeah. Nice. We'll, okay. So, we'll if you, so uh, honestly, I guess there's three ways you can enter. Yeah. Um, and with that being said, um, yeah, join the contest, please. Well, yeah, let's go back do to the, the contest. Let's, let's go get back, back to the, to the show. show. <laughs> We've returned. Um, I looked up the basilisk. Indeed, you did. It's a snake, mostly. Sometimes. There's like a rooster About thing. About 50% of the time. Yeah. It's also a chicken. It's, yeah, like a, yeah. And then there's like a centipede snake. So got lots Did you of say there was one that looked like a wyvern? There's one that looks like a wyvern a little bit. You see that one in the middle there? Oh, what is this? I don't know. I'm that's just pretty wicked cool. Yeah, I'm just scrolling the top. Oh, of that's the just thing a Google that's a straight D and D basilisk. This one on the right. But anyways, okay, sick. Our, our uh, this listeners guy? can't see any of this. Yeah, the purple guy. Let's get back to Medusa's. It's okay. They can <laughs> Google alongside me, listeners. <laughs> and not if you're driving. Put your phone down. <laughs> now, five <clears throat> E doesn't have the dimorphism. Amongst male and female Medusa, or at least there's nothing written down that I could find, but every other edition does. So, Medusa males and females are inherently different um, beyond just their gender. The males, also known as Midar or Madar, or Mandusa, or Mandusas, are bald headed instead of having dozens of poisonous snakes growing from their scalps. Okay. Um, their blood is also distinctly more poisonous than their female counterparts. Um, furthermore, males lack the ability to petrify their victims with their gaze. Instead, they have a different magical gaze ability. Males' eyes project this mind-infecting poison that ravages both the mind and body, leaving its victims dazed, weak, and ripe for the killing. I can poison you psychically yeah. from across the room. I'm like, what is mind poison? Like, is it, like is, <laughs> mind poison? Like, is it, <laughs> how can you call it a poison unless there's actually like a physical, like tangible? Thing to it, you it's, know what I mean? It's like bad uh, sci-fi movies, right? Or like yeah. bad horror movies. <laughs> That's like mind poison. For right? me, it's like that. Yeah, it, for me, it's like it's okay. They have a psionic ability that they can use their eyes to do. But anyways, yeah, it's just psychic damage. Exactly. Um, you think you're poisoned? It's like if you get poisoned in the Matrix, you get poisoned in real life. Mm, fair enough. I think I don't know how that works. Right. So overall, <laughs> my body thinks it's poisoned. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. So overall, Medusa are beings of cruelty, dominance, arrogance, and vanity. Uh, Medusas usually live alone, uh, forever in seclusion, alienated from the world around them by their monstrous form and their wickedness. Um, their homes will gradually fall into disrepair until they are little more than shadowy ruins covered with thorns and creepers, riddled with obstructions and hiding places. For why though? Just because they can't be bothered to do anything about it, and they're miserable. Why even get a house? Because I gotta live somewhere, Brian. <laughs> I God live, damn it! <laughs> I live somewhere. It doesn't matter. I'm just gonna let it go. To, okay, okay, but that's not true for all Medusas. So for those whose ambitions outweigh their shame, they fix their house in broken windows and stuff. No, but <laughs> this state of affair is hardly tenable. Uh, some Medusas may choose to seek out wealth, and most importantly, the power and influence within the societies of other humanoids that they so desire. And Medusa may even come to work together to achieve such ends. So a brood of Medusas might rule over a terrified populace as a royal family, or a single Medusa might act as the secret boss of an assassin's guild. Whoa, <clears> okay. <throat> yeah, they... The Okay. So the 5th edition origins say that, like, the reason that they became Medusas in the first place is because they desired power and wealth and influence. Totally. So, like... Just because they're ugly now doesn't mean they still don't want those things. Well, some of them get discouraged. Yeah, like, some of them, oh, yeah. Like, oh. Some of it, it breaks them. But the <laughs> other ones, it only makes them stronger. It only makes them stronger. <laughs> they, they team up. They infiltrate the stock market. Right. Exactly. So Medusas believe that their killing gaze is evidence that they are destined to rule over other humanoids. Uh, small Medusa clans move through the wilderness in search of weak settlements to rule. Uh, individuals uh, sometimes settle in cities to build up criminal guilds uh, and eventually make a play for power. Medusas mm -hmm. that gain control 
uh, over their environment or territory or city or whatever will bully their populace, quelling dissent with statuary gardens, you know, like, fuck with me and you're going to become part of my statue garden. It's all um, these statues outside the town. I, I think know, they're fucking right? ru- trying to run away. <laughs> exactly. What's up with this place? Uh, rampant venomous snakes roaming the cities and <laughs> the deaths of those who speak out against them. Step one, two, and three of identifying Medusa takeover is insane. I know. It's Four very obvious. Horrifying statues and then you like can't make turn a fucking corner without yeah, getting bit in the shin. the snake, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Some Medusas even go as far as to claim godhood and demand worship, while others tell themselves as, like, oracles or sages. Mm. Um, but, yeah. So males in Medusa society fill a more subservient role. Okay. Um, they serve the role of hunters, guardians, scouts, and mates. Um, only mates that have immunity to the petrification can hope to rise above females in Medusa society. I don't care if you're ugly, baby. <laughs> so <laughs> not all males are immune to the petrification, which in D&D is like a voluntary thing Medusa's do. It's not like Medusa uh, from uh, Greek mythology. It was involuntary. Okay. Um, so not all males are immune, but the ones that are are actually treated very specially, um, and they are kind of separated from their other male counterparts, and mm. basically they're raised up to be leaders. Okay. Yeah. So the... Typical Maidar, or male Medusa, is a monogamous who mates for life. He's fiercely devoted to his mate and will go to any length to assist and or avenge her. Dope. So that's pretty cool. That's kind of how their society works. Um, mm. Despite their inherent arrogance and power, Medusa are extremely sensitive to their own mortality and to the limited distance of their petrifying gaze. So they're notoriously cautious in battle and in choosing the targets uh, only when they're sure to be able to kill them with ease. That makes total sense. It makes sense. They want no mortality, so they're scared of dying, so they're really careful. I love the lore that includes like how to role play the monster in combat. Mm. That's good. It's like... Yeah, they're going to they're not just like running in like gnolls. Yeah, they're not mindless creatures. Yeah. So <clears throat> now a mood a Medusa is subject to its own curse um, by looking vainly into its own reflection while engaging its petrifying gaze. It can turn itself to stone. Bummer. So as a result, a Medusa destroys or removes any mirrors or reflective surfaces in its lair and never keeps any treasure with reflective surfaces among its hoard, vaults, collections, etc. That's how you know it's your town that's ha- it's happening to. The glass maker is the first to die. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another fun fact, the blood of a Medusa can reverse petrification. So one must apply a few drops of the creature's blood to the lips or mouth of a petrified creature and voila, it'll work. Oh, cool. Okay. So if a Medusa gets petrified... If that's how you take it down and it like stoned up one of your homies, uh-huh. then you're not going to be able to retrieve no blood. No, you have to find another Medusa. Dang. Yeah, which could take years. It's a whole nother campaign arc. I, just trying to find some Medusa blood. Yeah. I think at that point you would just find a wizard that could fucking help you out or a cleric that could help you out. <laughs> and they're like, no, I don't get near that shit, man. <laughs> right. You're crazy. <laughs> Let your friends be dead. So there does seem to be uh, some strange ties between the Medusa and the UNT. You know, both snake people, so I guess yeah. they go along. At times, they may follow the same serpent deities, but the bond between the two races seems to run deeper than religion. Medusas are deeply loyal to UNT. A Medusa's arrogance vanishes in the presence of even one of these serpentine tyrants. Mm. Uh, UNT say that Medusas owe their existence to them, but this eerie deferential respect goes further than honoring ancestral ties. Even the snakes atop of Medusa's head bow when a UNT passes. They're they're leading the way in the material plane for, for snake people existence. I guess so, yeah. Mad spec. <laughs> Mad spec. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so last fun fact is Medusae are infrequently driven to mate with humanoid males or even Medusae males. Uh, in the event that a sexual partner of a Medusa is a humanoid, the act always ends in the male's death, usually by petrification, when the Medusa reveals it. It's previously hidden visage. Uh, two to six eggs are laid one month after copulation, and they hatch eight months after that. The female hatchlings appear as baby girls with stubby green tendrils. The hatchlings are revolting to look at, but cannot petrify with their gaze. <laughs> uh, Medusa grow at the same rate as humans. At about age two, the serpentine hair becomes alive and gains a po- its poisonous bite, and the Medusa can finally petrify with the onset of adolescence. Okay. So that's the life cycle of your Medusa. That's fun. Yeah. That's a fun one. Yeah, absolutely. So what? This, why are they mating with non-Mandusas? Because Mandusas are extraordinarily rare, and oh. they don't technically need Mandusas. And quite frankly, 5e never even says there are Mandusas anymore. Oh, okay. All They're the Mandusas died out in 4th edition. Regular mans. Yes, And you're exactly. using the regular mans. Can you imagine being like, can I see you again? And you just turn to fucking stone. <laughs> yeah. You're putting your pants back on. It's not good. <laughs> no, it's so horrible. <laughs> 
So terrible. Um, any questions about Medusa's before we get into the stat block, which I have right here? I want to hear the stat block. <clears throat> All right, let's see here. So they are, um, they're actually a pretty tough creature. We're looking at a challenge rating six. So this is, this is a boss creature at the lower levels for sure. And well, they're talking about them like they're a mob. Like there should be more than one at times. Or this is, th is this more like a hag? Like kind of power level? Yeah. Mm, yeah, I would say so. Okay. I mean, some hags are way more powerful than this, but yes. Sure. Um, but also I could see a tribe of Medusas uh, being like a mob type enemy at the very high levels. Okay. But like a on, coven. Yeah, like a coven of Medusas, okay, sure. if you will. So, medium monstrosity, considered to be lawful evil. Armor class 15, that is natural armor. It's just the way they are. Yeah, baby. 127 HP. These scales, though. <laughs> Speed of 30 feet. Strength 10, dexterity 15, constitution 16, intelligence 12, wisdom 13, charisma 15. You know, when it comes to these more humanoid-ish monsters... The, the six ability scores to me are meaningless. Like they should uh, vary from individual to individual. But I mean, mm. when you're just using a stat block, it, I guess it's just what you would use. Okay. Um, skills and deception, inside perception, and uh, stealth, dark vision, 60 feet. Who'd have thunk? Um, <laughs> Weird. Petrifying gaze. So this is their what's only dark, feature. Hey, what's dark vision? I know, right? So their only feature, uh, petrifying gaze. When a creature that can see a Medusa's eyes start its turn within 30 feet of the Medusa, the Medusa can force it to make a DC 14 constitution saving throw if the Medusa isn't incapacitated and can see the creature. If the saving throw fails by five or more, the creature is instantly petrified. Otherwise, a creature that fails to save begins to, begins to turn to stone and is restrained. The restrained creature must repeat the saving throw at the end of its next turn, becoming petrified on a failure or ending the effect on a success. The petrification lasts until the creature is freed by a greater restoration spell oh, or, shoot. or other magic. Uh, what Do you know what level greater restoration is? Because I'm not sure off the top of my head. Uh, I'll look it up, but okay. I wanted to talk about Medusa Mob Boss. That's just mm -hmm. making your feet into stone blocks. It's kind of taking a little bit <laughs> out of it. <laughs> I really like I really like that idea. That's super cool. Let me, uh, let me look up greater restoration. Okay, I'm still not done with the feature. Yeah, uh, go for unless it. Unless surprised, the creature can avert its eyes to avoid the saving throw at the start of its turn. Uh, if a creature... So, so that instantly descales the power of this. Okay. Um, if the creature does so, it can't see the Medusa until the start of its next turn. Okay, so back back powering it up because you're giving up uh, your ability to see your enemy. When it can avert its eyes again, if the creature looks at the Medusa in the meantime, it must immediately make the save. Um, oh, this is interesting. If the Medusa sees itself reflected on a polished surface within 30 feet of it and in an area of bright light, the Medusa is is... Oh, gosh, there is a typo in the monster manual. It says the Medusa is due to the due to its curse. Oh, affected by its own gaze. It's just odd phrasing. That's really odd phrasing. It's Let me reread that sentence. User error. <laughs> the Medusa is due to its curse affected by its own gaze. So I guess it isn't voluntary like I thought it was. Okay. It's interesting. I thought it would have been. Um, let's get into actions. They have multi-attack, so they can make three melee attacks, one with its snake hair and two with its short sword or two with its... Two range attacks with his longbow, snake hair, melee weapon attack, reach of five feet, plus five to hit. Damn, it's what I thought. So are they like, it's a headbutt attack. It's a headbutt. They're whipping <laughs> or, it around, yeah. Or is the snake like extending its body like a spring? I think a little bit of both. A little bit of both? <laughs> a little bit of both. shit. So it's a D4 plus two piercing damage, but then 46 poison damage on top of that. So it's a very potent melee Pretty attack. Good. Yeah. yeah. Short sword is pretty basic. Uh, plus five to hit, five foot reach, only does a D6 plus two. Just watch out for that headbutt. Yeah, man. watch out for the headbutt. Uh, longbow is plus five to hit, range one hundred and fifty to six hundred feet. One d eight plus two plus two d six poison damage. So the longbow is not too bad. So they coat their weapons and poison. Why not cut the swords and poison too? They don't have enough poison, man. I guess. I guess not. They're using it all on those arrows because you know they're going to be trying to long range you before. Anyways, you get, yeah, yeah, just like look into my eyes and take arrows to the face. Yeah, dude. What a, a smart Medusa's got a like a um, a maze of mirrors that they know how to look into so they don't get burned. You know. Well, that's, no. Oh, I mean, maybe, but like the part of their lore is they they don't fuck with mirrors. That's a, that's a bad Medusa. That's, that's a, bad a Medusa. standard standard low <laughs> low level Medusa, high level we boss need a genius, level genius Medusa. BBEG Medusa has a, a mirror hall. Can you imagine? That's fucked. And they know what angles to look at it yeah. to make you fuck up. Um, I like that. Greater that's, restoration that's really is fun. A, greater restoration is a fifth level spell. So it's pretty high. So if you're fucking with Medusa, you need to be pretty high level if you're gonna uh, think about curing that petrification. Or you're carrying <clears throat> your 
down foot your foot center block teammate over to the uh, the local cleric and paying him money. Well, the to local do... cleric I don't know have has access to the fifth level spells. I don't know, man. Like it's can, pretty high level. Can you mechanically do a thing where you take your your ailments to a like your more permanent stuff to uh, like a holy man and pay him to do the spell? Yeah, it just depends on like your world and your lore. But like, yeah, he's again, like, I don't go fight. Having, I just can do this magic from here. Yeah, having access to that spell means that you must be pretty high level, very powerful, which means that you're probably extraordinarily rare. Like there's probably very, very few people in the world that have your level of power unless you're playing in a very high magic kind of. Um, yeah, it's going to vary from camp. Yeah, I'm just yeah. saying there's you can make that an option sure. in your world. Like, Absolutely. Like video games do that, right? Like yeah, you can, of course they do. You yes. can go to the healer and uh, yes, he'll exactly. fix your whatever. That only happens to you every once and again. Right. And if you want a more video game-esque experience, you could definitely do that. Sometimes you can't get rid of cursed <clears throat> weapons without going to one of these dudes. And I think sure. that's the same thing in, in D&D. Yeah. Usually it's a plot point. Usually it's like, I got this cursed item. It's stuck in my hand now. I can't let go of it. It's making my life miserable. Um, <laughs> unfortunately... There is nobody in like my known region who can help me, so I got a quest to try and find a dude who can't help me. And everybody has to stay ten feet away from me at all times, <laughs> right? Because I will chop. Exactly, I can't stop myself <laughs> exactly. anymore. I'm cursed. All right, let's get ready for our long rest. Okay, the jammies are on. I read me bedtime story, Indeed. which was about Mandusas. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> and they're good pals, the Yuantes. Yes. And now I'm ready to go night night. But before I do that, we have some important things to talk about. Okay. Um, like stuff that people send us to read. Indeed. Patrons. This next uh, message is from Varys Ellen. Thank you, Varys. It says, uh, hey there, Will and Brian. Love this podcast and had a question for you guys to be read while preparing for a long rest and want your interpretation. How do you think dragons who like to talk with humanoids like Brass Dragon would deal with their frightful presence, both in role play as well as mechanically? Always bug me when listening to dragon episodes and getting conflicting lair effects with the frightful presence. P.S. I started playing D&D in almost... Uh, Almost two years ago, and since then, this is the only thing I listen to in my car on my commutes. Probably heard every episode at least two, three times. I love it. Keep going. Well, thank, thank you, you for listening, Varys. So let's address this in two parts. Um, yes. So how do you think dragons who like to talk with humanoids like Brass Dragon would deal with their frightful presence? So it's listed in the monster manual as an action. So, so they, they can just not use it. Don't do yeah, it. Yeah, well, because why would you? Unless you're trying to frighten the human. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You so, would use it. But we're, we're assuming that you're under the impression that it's just a... Uh, the word, fr- the phrasing, frightful presence, right. just means like it sounds like something. Its that presence just emanate- is just goddamn frightening, right? But Which it's it actually, probably is to a small degree. Well, <laughs> I, I almost but picture not in a it magical like, degree, like an animal rearing its its head to right. bite or something like that. That's like very scary, so yeah. you want to run away, like more like that. To be fair, in Dragonland specifically, uh, the dragon fear is exactly like that. It's just an aura they exude. They could turn it up, they could turn it down, but they can't turn it off. You're um, always kind of in the presence of the f- of this magical fear, and that includes the good dragons too. And mm-hmm. even when the good dragons are amongst allies in dragon form, they exude a small, small amount of dragon fear. Yeah. It's just like so you always know. Yeah. So the second part of this, um, the the conflicting layer effects with the frightful presence. So, okay. I mean, I again the dra- the frightful presence isn't p- constant, so uh, you. In order for there to even be conflicting effects, the dragon would have to use frightful presence at the same time it used a layer action that conflicted with it, which the dragon probably just wouldn't do. Because why would you do that? Yeah. So sure. I don't. I don't think there should be. I mean, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's some specific ones because there's a lot of dragon layer effects out there. Because if this person's under the impression that they're it's that always is constant, on, then, then that it, would cause a yeah, conflicting problems. Yeah. Sure. But it shouldn't be constant, so there shouldn't be any conflicting problems, and everything should be okay. Sweet. So yeah. I hope that helped. Indeed. Um, we have one more kind message from Justin Geiler. Thank you, Justin. Shout it out. Hi, Will and Brian. Over the summer, I rode my bicycle from D.C. to San Francisco. There were some long, brutal stretches of 100-degree heat, torrential downpours, and lonely country roads. Luckily, I discovered the dungeon cast early in the trip, and it was smooth riding from then on. Winky face. Your words kept my mind busy conjuring a world while I traveled through this one. I have since found the courage to start a D&D group with new friends in a new city. Oh yeah. None of us have played before, but it has been very gratifying to create an adventure together on a journey of our own making. Thanks for the laughs, the information, and the inspiration. Sincerely, Justin G. from Columbus, Ohio. <laughs> Thank you, Justin. You're a fucking straight badass. Holy fuck. P.S. <laughs> I have been racking my brain for ideas for a BBEG, oh damn, and your latest episode about Mechanus happens to be per- the perfect setting. Primus, mm. prepare yourself for the chaotic anarchy to come oh, as delivered shit. by a party of murderous hobos. Nice. At least I hope. I have no idea what these guys are going to do. 
Cool right. beans. Classic. That's awesome. All right, man. Thanks Thank a you, lot. Justin. Appreciate that. We appreciate it. Um, okay. Uh, check out Super Quest Saga, my dudes. What are you yeah. doing? <laughs> we're on a light hiatus right now. Let's talk about it a little bit. Yeah, we're, we're gonna, at the halfway point. We're going to be dropping. Uh, we had just dropped an episode. We're going to do a questions episode. If you're a patron, um, submit some questions for us to answer. We've got some stock questions, like some fact, some frequently asked stuff that yeah, we're going to yeah, cover. Definitely. We're going to talk about characters. We're going to talk about campaign, world building, magic settings. We're going to talk about a lot of stuff. Mm-hmm. If you guys have any specific questions you want answered, wh- whatever happened to this guy, maybe we maybe we can, maybe we can't. We'll, we'll let you know. But go ahead and submit yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, because there's spo- spoiler stuff. Spoilers, Like, yeah. what happened to Fred Lowe? <laughs> Shit. I'm... I'm wondering too, guys. <laughs> I mean, I know, but yeah, you should, we'll, I would be yeah. worried if you didn't know. <laughs> yeah, well, not worried, but like, eh, yeah, yeah, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. But if you have questions, send them in. Indeed. Um, and get caught up. Tell somebody about Super Quest Saga. Um, there's a lot more people watching the show more than ever. I would mm-hmm. say. Yeah, as, definitely. As yeah, absolutely. With both shows. Um, mm-hmm. so thanks if you're new for coming on board. Uh, tell somebody about our shows. That's the best way to help us out if you feel like helping us out. If not, you can get on Patreon, check out your bonus content. Uh, after this recording, me and Will are going to record another one, and then we're going to do an episode X. Um, that's basic, or we're calling it the Dungeon Chats, where me and Will talk about everything that isn't Dungeons and Dragons. Indeed. Um, or we do. It's whatever. We it's do. Whatever, whatever we talk about we whatever the fuck we want. We talk about whatever the fuck we want. And <laughs> you can come get to your notice a little bit. So uh, that's once a month. You can get these episodes that we're recording in batches ahead of time. As soon as I do them. As soon as I edit them. I put them into the Patreon. Yeah, so Usually the same day. Usually the same day. Uh, a couple weeks early. Um, Ad free. Light edit. <laughs> uh, so the other thing we want to talk about. Uh, we did the contest. Mm-hmm. We talked about Patreon, mm-hmm. Flashbang and the Surgeons in there. Mm-hmm. You can get a mug with Grumsh's face on it. Says what the can. Grumsh. Yeah. Um, that's it. Let's get the fuck out of here. All right. We'll talk to you guys Bye. later. <laughs>